This is Mabbit47, an original droid that was my third scratch building project from back in September of 2021. It was made from a Gatorade bottle cap, super glue containers, and just a, a, a bunch of other stuff. Unfortunately though, I got a little ambitious with Mabbit's pose, and though he was upright long enough for his glamour shots, he was not able to stand the test of time. This is Gamey Builds, and today we're going to give Mabbit a giant bird to ride, because I figure, hey, if the droid couldn't stand on two legs, why not try two? After the epic epoxy disaster of my last build, it wasn't just my confidence that took a toll, but also my beloved cutting mat. So before starting this new project, I decided to treat myself to a brand new mat. And at twice the dimensions of the last one, we've got plenty more space for future mistakes. I don't usually sketch out my ideas because I prefer a run and gun style of scratch building, but since birds are pretty foreign to me, I thought it might be a good idea to get my thoughts on paper first. I'm obviously drawing heavy inspiration here from chocobos from the famed Final Fantasy series of video games, along with horse claws, the giant bird mounts from the Miyazaki film Nausicaa. Interestingly, after poking around on the internet, I discovered that Final Fantasy creator Hironobu Sakaguchi has actually cited Nausicaa as an influence on his series, and has stated that his birds were inspired by Miyazaki, so this is basically just one big incestuous cycle of inspiration and, like the real world, will no doubt lead to an aberration. Next, I put this new gizmo to work, a cool little rotating pedestal recently built for me by a friend of mine. I added a few holes for this coat hanger wire, which I wrapped in a thinner wire for the bird's armature. This will reinforce the legs a bit and also give some tooth to the otherwise smooth metal surface, which will help keep the clay in place. Next comes aluminum foil, which is lighter and cheaper than clay and thus used often in making these sculpture cores. Polymer clay was then added to the legs and core. As the base layer of clay, none of this will be seen in the final product, so I'm merely trying to get the basic shape right and make everything beefier after baking. Once baked and hardened, I added the torso and neck, which is more of the same, aluminum chunks with coat hanger wire embedded for easy attachment. After repeating this uh, process over here, I washed my hands thoroughly and began to cover everything in a generous layer of polymer clay. Although I'm fairly new to sculpting, I'm really enjoying the learning process here. To me, it complements scratch building well. Whereas scratch building involves identifying and combining pieces to achieve a final design, with clay, the sky's the limit, and I was really hoping that the more organic shapes achieved by this medium would complement the rougher, more precise form of the droid. With everything bulked up in a soft layer of unbaked clay, I then started detailing, beginning with the hips and the back. I'm starting here as practice, since most of this will be covered by Mabbit and the saddle, so it's a good place to make mistakes. I took a bit of practice to get the feathers to look right, but I thought this looked okay, especially after adding some stray feathers to the hips. I'm taking some pointers here from the design of ostriches and cassowaries for the legs, with these skin folds, pockets between the Achilles tendon and tibia, and these tiny scaly indentations. The toes were then built individually with little cylindrical bits of clay, and then it was all attached and blended together. For the head, I started off with a ball of clay, hollowed it out, and then blended it into the neck. Off camera, I added a two-piece beak, then textured the neck using the same technique as before. To help smooth out the rougher edges produced by carving clay, I dabbed on some rubbing alcohol and brushed. Now on to detailing the head, and I'm using the same method as before, adding bits of clay here and there to get the general form I'm after, then blending it all together. I also realized that using this ball tip stylus created a pretty nice feather texture for a smaller scale, so I went with it. 
For the bird's crest feathers, which I wanted to stick straight up like he was trying out for a 90s boy band, I used snipped up bits from an aluminum oven pan, coated them in a thin layer of clay, bent them into the approximate shape I wanted, and then smudged everything into place. I then went back and trimmed the beak a bit to make it match my original concept art more. I'm leaving it ajar because I'm going to be sticking something in it later, though at this point I wasn't sure what. After that it was just a matter of more faux feathering on the torso, and then it was time to add the tail feathers. For these feathers, I'd previously rolled out thin strips of clay and textured them with a broken comb. To get them to bake and harden at the right curvature, I made this gimpy little stand by notching a stirring stick at both ends, sticking in a piece of lightweight cardstock, and then just draping on the clay feathers in different positions. The reason I only had a stand on one side was that this would give me different curves, and consequently more varied feathers to work with later. While this little detail made sense at the time, I regret it in hindsight. I thought that these little notches in the feathers would make them look more feather-like, which would have worked if the feathers were at 1-1 scale, but since these are giant feathers on the butt of a giant bird, they shouldn't look like this, but I'm not sure why I'm calling attention to it. Inserting the feathers was a real fun time. The bird's body was still soft at this point, while the feathers were baked and hard, so to get them to stick, I ended up attaching bits of wire to the undersides of the feathers, then poking them in one by one. For the wings, I went about things much the same way as the legs, starting off with this copper wire wrapped in thinner aluminum wire, after coating those pieces in clay, I then added some of that aluminum baking pan material to give the clay for the wing feathers some support. For those wing feathers, I knew I really wanted to show off all the details, so I opted for the more painstaking method of laying down one feather at a time, then texturing it with a ball-tipped tool. It was important to me to be accurate here, so I had this huge array of bird's wings images on a monitor right in front of my face in my workspace to make sure I was getting that cool layered look. And after repeating that on the undersides of the wings, it was a pretty straightforward process to stab the wing joints into the bird's body. Hide the ugly joints, I added a few more feathers to the shoulder blades, I guess you'd call them. I next primed this feisty fowl with a Mod Podge and paint mix and got about, oh, this far before I was like, yo, I own spray paint, what am I doing with my life? I spray painted green. I chose green because I didn't want to make it yellow, which would be too close to a chocobo, but also because I thought the contrast with the dusty red of my droid might work as a complementary color. With that green in mind, I found this real life reference, and can we just take a moment to appreciate how beautiful the iridescent colors are here on this hummingbird? Actually on second thought, let's not, because it's going to make my frumpy pancake of a bird look even worse in comparison, and yeah, this, this, is, this is terrible. So I got to work painting, starting with this metallic Envy Green, their name, not mine. I then blended in this native turquoise, it's racist, to give the color more dimension. Before adding any other colors to the feathers though, I mixed in just a bit of this black airbrush paint with the metallic green and used this for the beak, the legs, and the wingtips. I didn't want to just use pure black here, as I suspected that a tiny hint of green in the color would work better, and there's just something about a tiny bit of metal filament in paint that works for something organic like this. Then came this metallic blue to sort of fool the eye into thinking there was a range of iridescent colors here. It didn't work. Finally, the eyes got a coat of pure black, and if they look soulless and scary to you, don't worry, I'm going to come back and make them slightly better. 
After adding a bit of yellow here and there to round out the colors and a couple of coats of black wash to darken the shadows, this was the result. I then revisited the eyes with just a touch of brown and then got to working on Mabbit my droid. Mabbit is a nickname, by the way, derived from the ear-like antenna on the sides of his head. The hips and legs needed to be redesigned to get him to sit properly on the bird, so I made some brute force modifications, then re-glued the legs into the desired pose. After drilling some new holes for the hip joint, things were looking pretty good. While Mabbit recovered from his plastic surgery, I started working on the saddle, for which I used this Sculpey air dry clay. This is the original block of clay that I opened when I made Jeff the robot back in November. It lasts forever if you keep it moistened with an occasional spritz of water and store it in a sealed plastic bag. Air dry clay is great for shaping and texturing, but it does take about a day to dry out fully, so it was time to sideline the saddle and begin the base, which for this build is this cool little hexagon frame I recently purchased for just a dollar. After patching the screw holes and smearing some modeling paste into the wood grooves to remove the texture, I let it dry, sanded it smooth, then painted with this brownish black with sand mixed in for texture. The idea was that I wanted my bird standing in a stream, so after the base was painted, I drilled some tiny holes for the feed wires, stuck them in, and learned this vital lesson about armatures. Make the wires that attach to the base much longer than this. But that's neither here nor there because it was time for making tiny riverbed stones. This is unbaked polymer that I rolled and then stuck all over the place. I made kind of a lot of stones. Honestly, I don't recall much of this. The sun was in the sky when I started, and when I finished, it wasn't, so I may have been in a coma. Before baking the stones in place, I also decided that I was going to make a fish hanging out of the bird's mouth, so I carved one from this little segment of clay. By the way, I don't have a name for this species of bird, so if you've got a suggestion, leave it in the comments. I'm still working out the lore of this world in my head, but I like the idea of a derelict society where droids and animals mingle freely and humans are a scarcity. I'll probably return to it in future builds. With everything baked, I coated it in melted chocolate brown and purposely went with a light coat to let the cream-colored rocks peek through a bit. I then gave the ground a muddy cocoa color before adding some flecks of mint to the rocks. Lastly, I sprinkled on some flocking to achieve a delicate coating of algae or matcha, depending on how hungry this segment made you. By now the saddle was dry, so it was time for the rest of the leather hardware, for which I cut up these thin strips of air dry clay and pressed them into place. For texture, I used the handle of my X-Acto knife, as well as a ball tip stylus. And while it dried, I made a few more fish, then painted them. I struggled quite a bit finding the right color scheme, and I think where I really went wrong here was not using translucent clay for the fins and tail, which would have been so much better. Eventually though, I settled on this, and it looks great if you blur your eyes and forget what fish look like. Finally, I painted my saddle in this leather brown gave it a wash for weathering purposes, and dry brushed on some lighter brown that can't be seen. Looking back, I think I was actually procrastinating here because I didn't exactly relish the next step of this build, pouring resin for the water. If you watch my last video, then you'll know why, but I was determined to be extra cautious this time around, starting with careful measuring, precise cutting, some very satisfying snapping, and then attaching all those acrylic bits to the hexagon base. I decided against hot glue this time, instead opting for a generous lathering of white glue, which I thought might make for a better seal. To further seal every little potential leak area, I superglued the holes for the wire under the base, then added baking soda to accelerate the dry time and really solidify everything. I learned this technique from BP Custom Creations. Go check out his stuff if you don't know it. If this seems overkill for a little resin, <laughs> trust me, it isn't. 
This is resin epoxy, the Houdini of craft supplies. You could literally put it in a locked vacuum sealed chamber and toss it into a volcano and somehow it'd still be all over your workbench when you got home. To test my seal, I added just a bit of water and would you look at that, we've got a leak. After a second round of white glue and tape, and I think maybe a welding torch and the flex seal guy, I held my breath, mixed up my resin with a bit of green dye, and prayed. If any of you viewers out there are looking for an extreme hobby to really get your adrenaline pumping, try pouring resin. It ranks right between bomb defusal and skydiving. And amazingly, it worked! No giant bubbles, no exothermic reaction, no leaks, no floaters. In my relief, I took a giant breath and got a little lightheaded from inhaling all those epoxy fumes. The resin needed a day to set fully, so I used that time to make tiny accessories for Mabbit. This is mostly clay, but there is a tiny toy bit that snuck its way in for one of the satchels. But after a brown coat of paint and a black wash, it all looked pretty leathery. Another tiny detail that needed making was a saddle handle. I decided against any sort of reins or bit for the birds, so I guess the rider just kinda hangs on for dear life as the animal runs amok. With the resin fully cured, I was pleased to find that this time, the acrylic mold popped right off. However, due to the surface tension of the liquid, the resin had sloped up against the walls, so it needed to be sanded down with a Dremel. There were also these annoying little pockets of air at the corners that the resin hadn't penetrated, so I cleaned them up a bit, then dribbled on the newest tool to my arsenal, this UV resin. If you're unfamiliar with UV resin, it hardens just like two-part epoxy resin, but it cures almost instantly when exposed to UV light. I finally sanded everything down, first with my Dremel and then this hand sander, starting with this 200 grit sandpaper and working my way up to 2000. After dusting it all off and then wiping down the resin with a damp paper towel, I sprayed it with this gloss finish and the result was... To add ripples to the water, I carefully squeezed out some UV resin streaks, then cured. I almost bought myself a crafter's UV flashlight, but my wife apparently already had this one for her nails, and it actually did a terrific job. Just, you know, FYI for those of you who work in a nail salon and are thinking of getting into scratch building robots. Even with the ripples, the water surface was still a little glossy for my liking, so I decided to add this water effect, mixing glossy Mod Podge with this scenic water effect paste. The paste by itself was too thick, while Mod Podge is the consistency of yogurt you forgot in your trunk for an afternoon, but when combined, they created just the right texture. The bases for my builds are usually pretty boring, but I decided to do something a little special with this one. Using these tongue depressors, I first cut the edges at a 60 degree angle, then weathered them with a push pin, split them in half because I'm dumb and should have bought popsicle sticks. Then I glued the planks into place, and added copious amounts of brown and black washes to give it an old wooden look. With all that done, all that was left was mounting Mabbit. Then adding his many, many accessories.
I'm gonna stop saying that projects end up more complicated than I expect because that's clearly the rule and not the exception, but I'm going to go ahead and say that I'm pretty proud of this one. A lot of different artistic disciplines had to come together here to make it work, and while there was no shortage of mistakes along the way, the end result is closer to what I envisioned than in any of my previous builds. I'm especially pleased that the color palette gelled nicely, as one of my big concerns early on was that the bird's color was much too bright. All in all, this was a delight to make, and I'm eager to get started on the next one. As always, I'm open to critiques and suggestions, and your comments, likes, and subscriptions really do help my teeny old little channel grow. Whether or not you decide to click the clicky stuff, thanks so much for watching, and until next time, this is Gamey Builds, over and out.